Hey, hey guys, welcome back to Awakening with Ali. I'm so honored and excited for today's guest. I have such a beautiful woman and soul and such a light in someone I've recently connected with and done healing sessions with, and I just can't say enough good things. So honored to have her here. I have the beautiful Simone, and I want you guys to hear a little bit about her journey before we kind of dive into all things kind of going on in the collective. It's all about spirituality. I'm just so excited for this conversation. So Simone, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes. Oh my gosh. So there's so much about you when it comes to, you know, you helping so many heal and your own spiritual journey and all the things. Why don't you tell us a little bit kind of just about you and, and how you got here? Cause everyone's journey is different to really awakening, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so where shall I start? <laughs> Give you the abridged version. So when I was very young, I would see spirits and hear things. And I thought it was really strange because my parents couldn't explain it. In fact, they thought I was a little bit mad. So I would lie in my bed and have these strange energies come in and these strange apparitions and didn't know what to make of it. So then one day I went to my mother and said, look at the dog over there. It's, it's, it's running around with our dog. And she said, that dog died a couple of days ago. And I immediately, as soon as she said that, the dog disappeared. And she, then she said, I don't know what you're talking about. That isn't possible. And so then all the apparitions and the ghostly like mm, spirits all disappeared. And it was like she, it wasn't her fault, but it was as if she had shut down my own belief in what I was seeing. Journey continues. I feel like the odd one out because I'm, I, I, I am involved in understanding, you know, the non-physical as a child, teenager. And then I start to shut it down purposefully, like because I wanted to fit in. I immerse myself in business. I had a diversity of businesses from fashion to stock market to civil construction and humanitarian. I did some humanitarian work for a foundation over in Uganda. And all through that period, as I was, I was using all of my business acumen and strategic kind of brain, this was this ast astrological clairvoyant, uh, spiritual, trying to understand the mind traveling around the world in the middle of all of that that was always there in the background like gnawing at me like a rat and it got to the stage where whilst I was in those businesses I was doing this astrological clairvoyance working with people healing them asking questions they would also shall I say vomit out <laughs> what was going <laughs> on for them in their lives and I couldn't help but give advice whilst I was in fashion or I was doing the civil construction side of things or when I was in Uganda doing the humanitarian work it would just automatically come and I would share it but it felt like I was hiding in the closet so it got to a stage where the last the humanitarian work just dissolved just like the other businesses d dissolved and I not, not dissolved I'd sold them or I'd moved on or something else sparked my interest but then it was I couldn't ignore it anymore and the feeling of spirits coming through and I couldn't see but I could hear and it was getting stronger and I was more dissatisfied with where I was and then realized how much that I had hidden myself from allowing this to be me because there was always a lot of pressure to be business or doctor or some sort of professional person that wasn't me so long story short was that I came out of the closet and I started doing this work and, and experimenting with what would work, what wouldn't work. I was never interested in doing anything formal, like a modality as such that, you know, such as kinesiology or Reiki or whatnot. I just had a blend of all of these different things that I wanted to pull together until I got to a place of working with people that I was really satisfied that, we, that accelerated healing was occurring and yeah that's well also there's another element to my story is that i developed cancer when i was uh 23 wow it was like, you know over 20 years ago and i knew that the cancer in my throat thyroid 
was a result of me not speaking. It just, it just came in. It was just so obvious. And the lump was so big that it was starting to constrict uh, around my jugular. So I did have to get half of it removed in order to stop uh, the throttling on one side of my throat. However, knowing that I was not speaking and I didn't speak at school, I was very shy and I was bullied as well. So it really shut me down even further. That interest also in the mind body link and what that was all about and how I'd received that message was okay, I need to explore that more. So I'd had the operation to remove half the tumor or the, all the tumor on that side of my throat, but it had spread. So the cancer had spread over to the right side, and I was warned that it could go into bone cancer. And I just knew I wasn't supposed to get the other half of my thyroid out. So I went with that. The surgeon and the, and the doctor thought, what are you, basically, what are you doing? And I said, no, no, I'm going to heal it myself. And so that, that also, at the age of 23, reignited um, this journey of understanding what has the mind got to do with disease? And it really opened up another Pandora's box of Buddhist philosophy, sh shamanic practices, understanding thoughts, beliefs, where they come from, how they impact the body, why are they impacting the body? And when I understood, well, I'm still understanding. I certainly haven't got it all, all figured out. But when I was able to comprehend what I had created for myself, then I was able to uncreate it. And ever since then, I've, I've had my bone marrow test to ensure that, you know, the cancer isn't spreading. I've been cancer free for the last 20 years. Wow. And that's I, incredible. And I also learned with other ailments that i had had as well, like, you know, like staff, for instance, golden staff, I contracted that as well. And I, I understood where it had come from, what was actually going on with me for that infestation. And again, had cured myself from it um several days later so things like that really interested you know using myself as a petri dish or using myself as an experiment that's how i kind of worked going forward wow that's so incredible and like so powerful that you were able to step away from obviously that removal and i'm sure like medically they were like what are you insane like get the other side removed and you're like no i'm gonna heal myself and you know when you spoke to the fact that you know you were quiet as a young girl and also your mom you know, had shut down essentially your abilities and what you were seeing and believing and, you know, and taking in obviously, you know, that tap back into like your truth and your, in your throat chakra and, and all of that. And, you know, I think more and more people are learning like the things they allow to be blocked and the things they allow to essentially manifest, like you said, become disease, become an ailment, become something because it just sits and essentially creates itself. So, so fascinating that you dove in and you were able to kind of not only analyze yourself, but then receive that healing within yourself and move yourself forward. So that must have been surreal for you to go from that 23 year old to like, you know, where you are now, or even a few years ago, and, and now not only have healed yourself and tested over and over and seen your, you know, totally healthy and clear, but now you're healing others in so many different ways. It's got to be a little surreal for you to see that. Yes. Yeah. I always go in with the intention to allow these for me to facilitate for these people to heal because their intention is just as strong as what mine is. And so that is part of the process, the commitment to want to heal. And then there's such a wide variety of, of different beliefs and stories that come through but ultimately it comes down to self-love ultimately it's the love of self so but we have to unravel the stories and the emotions that are associated with that lack of love for oneself that false identity that's constantly speaking and and identifying with things that just aren't true that that do not have any relevance for the beautiful eternal beings that we all are. 
Wow. That's so powerful. And I mean, you know, like you said, when you were a kid and you were seeing things and you were feeling things and you knew what you were experiencing, not only was it shut down, but you were essentially looked at as like, you know, this is obviously not normal. And this, you know, even these conversations weren't happening the way they are now. And so I could only imagine for you as a young girl, like how out of the box you felt and how out of place in society. And so, like you said, you just wanted to fit in. And I think so many of us, like at least I know myself and I would feel like anyone listening could relate to that and would say like, yeah, at some point in time, I really badly wanted to fit in. And it's so funny, like even for me in my own journey, the more and more I start to really release that and realize like, no, I just want to love myself. Like you said, I just want to be myself and be uniquely me and embrace that and not care about anything else. The more you really do tap into yourself and you're like, oh, wait, but I was here all along. (laughs) Exactly. It's that false identity that's being ripped away. And when you go into that place of acknowledging, loving, connecting with self, that inner inner being, the higher self, it's got many, many names, there there starts to, there's a hum, a peacefulness, a calmness that sits in the background so that no matter what is happening in the foreground, chaotic, and as we know, the world is in a, in a crazy bit of st- chaos right now that no matter what is happening on the outside challenges will always occur but if you've got that calm resilient peaceful state all will be okay yeah such a good reminder and and I love that you said that you know with a collective because I want to I want to go there and dive into that but before we do can you kind of speak to that self-love piece a little bit more and why not only that is so important but how, you know, you kind of get to that place. Of course, you know, that comes from healing that comes from the things we talked about and, you know, working with you or other healers or people that, you know, can help you with that. But at least on the basic level of like, to you personally, what self-love means and what that looks like and how you achieve that. Because I feel like clearly right now where we are in the world, there's a lot more self-love needed. Absolutely. And I think that's where we're all going as the um, the ascension process, the vibration increases, our shadow is coming to the forefront. But let me give you an example of a client that I just saw in regards to self-love as, as an example of how wanting it, but resisting it, because it's always there. The love for self is not a construct of making it happen or doing to facilitate its existence it's already there so this client it's a him um he the story he told himself and his upbringing was his mother was a prostitute his father never paid him any attention uh his sister was really violent and aggressive he was bullied at school he hardly ever had any food to take to school so they would throw food at him And so this story cultivated this belief that he was unworthy, unlovable. It was just, it was so acutely obvious to him that why would anyone love him after this zone, this environment that he grew up in? So as a result of that, he took on the identity of being unlovable and forgot who he really was. And then began as a means of compensating or trying to get it, he would do 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 rescue help people you know to the point where he wasn't sleeping at night because he was always doing things for people it was like really extreme almost like addictive destructive behavior and so when he would get a little bit of his fill of receiving something in return for what he did he felt satisfied for maybe five minutes but then what would return was the dissatisfaction around who he was and that identity because it was so strong in the dialogue of the story that he still hadn't cleared and so what we needed to do was have him recognize that his environment and the circumstances that he had endured and he had seen and all the messages that were coming at him were actually not who he was but he was a circum he was it was circumstantial of what he had placed himself into and almost brainwashed himself into thinking that that was his truth wow so, we, so in order to dissolve that identity we had to go back to the pain we had to go back to the memories and that wasn't to you know for any purpose to torture him because it's a very short process and i think as you know 
um, it was it was to allow him to see the trapped compartmentalized emotions associated with the story, associated with the memory. And once he saw the humiliation and once he saw the rejection and the abandonment, and once he saw how unloved he was, he actually saw it. He wasn't, a, he wasn't avoiding it or resisting it or trying to put it in a box and trying to run from it by doing something else. He actually saw it. And by sitting in that pain, he was actually able to transmute it. And wow, by doing that's that, amazing. And when he did, he, he was calm. He didn't actually feel it anymore. He didn't know where it went. And he came back to himself with this different perception of who he was intrinsically. It was always there. So that's really what I want to impart. It's always there. It's more so about removing the blocks, the obstacles, the dialogue, the, the emotions, the negativity associated with those emotions and the memories associated with those emotions. Casting off layers of the onion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mean, that's, it's so incredible. And I mean, when you also spoke to in his story or really anyone's story, you said the compartmentalizing, right? Like most of us by society have been taught to compartmentalize. Don't show your feelings. Don't, you know, let yourself release, you know, numb yourself, you know, hide your feelings. The list goes on, you know, don't cry. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you do compartmentalize, right? And you just start to put things in just different like little drawers or boxes. And then all of a sudden you have no idea, everything's packed away and you never unpacked it. Exactly. It stays stuck in the cellular memory. It's part of, part of the story. And so when you're asking, say for love in this case, or when you're asking for this self-acceptance, what you're butting up against is the oppositional force of I'm not lovable. Yeah, to go back to your question, it may be something else you ask for. I want money or I, I, I want to be financially abundant and you're working towards in your business or you're working towards um, receiving it. But the oppositional uh, story and belief is I don't deserve to have abundance you know, and, and one may live in scarcity or one may uh, live in sabotage or one may get money and then lose money. It just depends on what the story is. And so I go back to a memory retrieval to be able to see where it all originated from so we can identify the emotions holding it back, clear it. And now we have no oppositional force anymore. It's been removed. Now we have intention and focus, the desire to create now without hindrance. And so yeah. things start to flow things start to happen. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and I recently went through that with you and we did um, for a show that's coming um, that we filmed and, you know, you did that with me and, you know, I've had a bunch of different types of healings over the years and, and things I've been more open to and vulnerable around, but this was so different. I was telling my husband and a couple of friends that I, you know, trust and I was telling them, I'm like, it was so powerful yet so intense yet so emotional, like so many things all at once. And it was just, but it was beautiful at the same time. And it was such a release. And there was so much that came up that like some of it I remembered, but some of it I didn't even realize like was there. And, and it's so, it was just so interesting, you know, how you said about that, that memory retrieval. And it goes back to what you were just saying with that cellular memory and how our body really does store everything. Yeah. Even if we compartmentalize it and pretend it's not there, it stays within us. Absolutely. And when it stays within us, it's living there like a squatter. And we, we just, you know, it's got, it's got a particular vibration and it does affect the body. And that comes back to my cancer story. Um, if it doesn't, doesn't leave, well, how is it going to affect your body going forward? If it doesn't leave, how is it going to affect your business or your relationship? It's one of my favorite areas to work on is relationships uh, because again, of what we're needing from, our partners but yet we're not seeing what it is that's within us that needs healing they're just triggering us into the into that space of healing uh, and they serve as a reflection as well so yeah there's there's so much to it but it's a very easy process and it's something that um you know i've refined over over the years to be able to take clients through so we don't need to spend six months in therapy I was going to say, it's like literally like how I would describe my experience was like, 
years of therapy in one hour or less, I just like whoosh, all came together and it was like, whoa, what is happening? And then I almost feel like I like went to other realms and then like, you know, out a day or two later, like now starting to integrate and release. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> it's like... Exactly. And when you say you went to other realms, you can be more accurate because when we're doing this, we are actually going at a soul spirit level of transition or transmutation. We're not operating from the mind because what is created at the level of the ego or the mind cannot be resolved at the level of the ego or the mind. Well, unless you're doing therapy for six or 12 months, maybe it can. But from this perspective, that's why it's so accelerated. And that's why maybe you may not remember parts of it, but you're still integrating and feeling lighter or things are changing or opportunities are coming or different different insights yeah it's on a whole other level yeah it's 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 so it's so powerful and so from there you were talking about a little bit about ascension and kind of also how the collective is in chaos I want to dive into both of those things but can we first start in the ascension space and like what that kind of means to you because obviously that's kind of what we are going through in the collective and even though some people don't understand it or they say it's woo or it's not happening like we are very much going through this process exactly well I can only tell you from my experience uh as to what I'm observing and what I'm seeing but I'm, I'm certainly not privy to the universal mechanics of what's happening <laughs> so the ascension process or the the um increase in vibration is happening on the planet now as a means of, I guess, transcending the ego or the egoic patterns, we're moving beyond that level of polarization into what purer consciousness, more awareness, more, more understanding of who we really are. And thereby, as we go through it, as you, you would know, the individual crisis that we can have maybe at the, let's just say at the end of a relationship or got, coming towards the end of a relationship, there is dissatisfaction, there is arguing, there is a rattling going on, there, you know, the, the, there is unnerving change. We can feel it coming along at the individual level. Well, this is what's happening at the collective level and there's a catalyst. And that catalyst, we can call it COVID um, or, or, or a virus or whatever you want to call it. And that catalyst has instigated fear and it's instigated a level of change and uncertainty that we never anticipated, but we're being forced into. And as, as a result of that, our shadow, the fear, the uncertainty, uh, issues about our relationships that were, were compartmentalized or, or not allowed to be seen because we had, we're so busy, all of a sudden now up. And we're being asked to clear the shadow. We're being asked to move into a space of more pure, refined consciousness, um, a level of awareness. And as a result of that, we're in chaos. We're in crisis because we're right in the middle of it. We're, let's just say if, if the last two years were, as an analogy, moving towards asking for a divorce, we're now in the stages of divorcing. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I feel like in the next couple of years going forward, we're in the process of letting go combined with recreating our life, which would mean maybe we're, we're selling the house or maybe we're moving to a different location. Maybe we're changing our job. So we're very shortly going to be entering into a phase of new visioning. But with that comes also the letting go and adjusting and grounding ourselves in the new. So there is a process still unfolding. And in the next, astrologically, within the next two years with Pluto going into Aquarius, we're going to see some really radical changes as far as the currency is concerned, our own state of evolution and community more community orientated, buffered also by technological advances bringing people together in a different way compared to the past, which has been very much Capricorn, Pluto in Capricorn, which has been about corporations, power, structure, separation. So we're entering into a very, very new epoch or era uh, 
where technological advancement as much as people, community, living, cohesion, collaboration, coming together is very much the forefront. What we need to work through is who is in control of that, who is in the, you know, in, in the driver's seat. And with Aquarius, we're always looking, you know, it always talks of either totalitarianism or a level playing field where people are together in a cooperative kind of engagement. Mm. So yeah, wow. watch this space. Yeah. Well, and like to give my listeners a little like behind the scenes, you know, this show I'm pre-recording. So we're actually recording on 2-2-22, which is a portal day actually today. And it was funny. I didn't even realize that when I booked you. And then I was like, of course, that's divine. (laughs) So this portal, right, that we're getting ready to go into, because you just spoke about the Pluto return, which is actually the day I didn't realize I released my podcast 2-22-22 is what you were just speaking of. So, you know, you talked about all these changes and shifts coming. A lot of people have kind of talked about Pluto return and why that's so massive. Can you tap into, you know, your own um, intuition and how you feel the start of this Pluto return and what it's going to kind of start to stir up in the collective as we go into this? Because now, you know, it's 2-2 today and we're only a few weeks away from how this is actually going to start. Well, the Pluto in in Aquarius that doesn't really solidify until 2024 but we will see it in 2023 go in briefly into that sign and then go back into Capricorn so 2023 is really going to see a transition phase between the old and the new but what we're seeing is the collapse of the old and you know when we're talking about the uh, the globalists or the elites and the people in power the same cycles that went on in the French Revolution and in the American Revolution are the same cycles that are going on now. And so we see this theme. And the theme of what we're observing is coming from enslavement into liberation. Going from corporatized structures into more freedom, community, regional community orientated uh structures we're moving into autonomy we're moving into sovereignty we're moving into higher levels of consciousness where no one controls us so this is exciting i mean intuitively when i'm looking at it i'm seeing hubs like community hubs or community like cities small cities like regionalized um come and you know, I'm seeing that from a technological point of view called DAOs, uh, decentralized, organized, organizational, um, no, sorry, autonomous organizations, they're called, they're short for, using blockchain technology. So these hubs that I'm seeing is about bringing people together, unifying them, bringing the collective into a place of love and connection and helping one another it's moving away from the separateness, the, you know, the power, the resource-based uh, control of the few. And if you look back at the French Revolution and the American Revolution, and funny how we kind of like repeat cycles, but we also kind of need to learn a little bit more. <laughs> is, <laughs> the French Revolution was about removing the monarchy. They had too much power and they let their people starve. And, it, you know, the, the, the famous saying by Marie Antoinette, uh, let them eat cake when they had none or they had, didn't even have bread. And so we're seeing a very similar mm, dynamic play out here with this control of a selected few wanting to have even more control and yet the people now pushing against it as they did in the French Revolution. And in your own American Revolution, it was about kicking the English out because they were too controlling and you know, imp- implementing taxes and uh, but, you know, like almost starving the people you know, off the land, you know, dictating how it needed to be based on their rules, not the people's rules. So that's what your constitution was, was created and based on. So right. he, yeah, and we're having the same cycle. So going forward in the next few years, and also to do with the, um, the United States, your constitution is having a Pluto return as well. So what that means is that you are, the, the United States is reinventing itself. 
It's creating a new constitution, a new means of living and how you all interact with one another. So especially the United States is going into a very new paradigm. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, we're, like you said, we're seeing this, you know, crumbling of systems all over. I mean, you're seeing all kinds of exposure on all different levels of CEOs and big players and elites resigning and jumping ship and all these things. And you're seeing, you know, I mean, every day I feel like I read about somebody now and and it's like, oh, okay. You know, and it's funny, like when I was first kind of waking up, I was like, oh, whoa, what's going on? But now I'm like, oh, this is all part of that collapse. Like this is all part of what you said, that crumbling of like what has to happen in order for us to go into the new. And then when you speak about, you know, kind of that rebelling and that standing up we're seeing that really big time right now right like with the canadian truckers and the convoys and what they're doing with the trucks and now the united states is about to start and follow suit and you know people are starting to push back against the mandates and all of these different you know things and say no like i'm you know i'm not going to do it i'm you know i'm meant to be sovereign as you spoke about the constitution and i have my god-given rights and you're not going to take them from me exactly exactly so that's what we're moving towards but we've been in this enslavement system without actually realizing we're part of this uh, treadmill and now we're busting it apart and you know, COVID or mandates or whatever you wanna call it has been a catalyst for the globalists to impart these other agendas on the back of it. And so we're realizing very quickly as a collective and those who want to actually create new systems are in the throes of creating it. We're just not seeing exactly what it is just yet we're still in what we would call like a the divorce stage we're like signing the papers <laughs> we still need to find the new place which we're going to live and our new community and our friends and maybe our new job so we're still maybe a little little bit away from that yet Wow. It's so, it's so wild when you, when you think about it and realize, like I've said to so many friends of mine who are kind of just starting to wake up themselves and they're like, what's going on? And I'm like, it's wild when you start to tap in and they're like, wow, I, I chose to be here at this time, right? Like my soul chose to be here during this wild time. <laughs> exactly. It is. It's huge. As far as uh, revolutions go or new epochs, it's huge because it is nothing like what has happened before, especially when we're looking at the changing of a currency system which has been around for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious, what do you, what do you think about that? What do you see with currency? Because I've heard this from, you know, kind of different um, prophetics as well and, and different people who are intuitive. You know, what is your take on how this is going to go with the currency? Well, what I'm seeing is that the, there'll be a global financial collapse and that is uh, predetermined. It, it, it's purposeful in order to bring in CBDCs, the new digital currency, in order to enslave people. However, um, with that comes choice. You either choose to be on such a system and those who are pretty aware and awake will refuse to be on such a system and will create the new system. So I think that that is a major turning point, a major tipping point. So I am seeing that occur from a fundamental level as well, because it is the, the fiat system, the cash currency is built on a house of cards. It's unsustainable. It's just built on debt upon debt upon debt. Thereby at some point it has a, or it has an end point, And that is approaching very quickly. Astrologically, I'm um, seeing that uh, between now, I'm getting a date around the, the February 15th, but it could, it could actually stretch towards October 16th when the final uh, Uranus-Saturn square hits as the last one. And then after that, we've got a little bit of reprieve. We've got no major, uh, what you would call major outer planet transits knocking us off our feet for a while. So we've got some... <laughs> So, so like really kind of like from the mid February to kind of like fall, it's going to be like game on with kind of all these different things playing out. Correct. Correct. And it may be a little bit rocky, but with the community cohesion, people coming together, helping each other, it just cultivates even more love, more, more connection, more ideas, you know, wanting to help one another. And that's really what the fabric of this is about. Love actually increases um, awareness, consciousness expands us, separation, the way that we've been living in our little units or in a high rise or away from the earth, that just cultivates more egoic um, craving, wanting, needing, that's never satisfied. It's never fulfilled. 
Right. Well, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but so much of that was done by design, right? By the current elites, power, whatever you want to call it, because they wanted it to be that way. And they wanted that system and the people to be separated, not tap into their higher consciousness and keep people kind of essentially asleep. Correct. And it's been in, done a number of ways, whether it's through religion or whether it's through um, societal rules or whether it's through television or media, a number of ways to keep us asleep. But we are participating in that sleepwalking. It's a matter of doing the work to extract ourselves from that place, even before it all comes crashing down. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I love that you said that because I was saying that to a friend of mine the other day who's like, you know, what do we do in this time? Because she's like wide awake and fired up. And I was like, look, I get it. Like, I've, I've been there and like, I'm still figuring out all the new things to do and help be a part of the you know, new earth, if you will, and, and changes and shifts. But I said to her too, I'm like, but we have to really focus on ourselves to be able to keep shifting things on a much more massive scale. So I love that you just said that, like when you do the work and you go inward and heal yourself, the more we're going to release this, the more we're going to help other people shift and bring more love and raise the consciousness and the vibration of this planet. Exactly. And that's why I'm doing the healing realm and bringing people on. So if you, if they want to accelerate or if they want to deal with the the individual shadow, let alone the collective shadow that's showing up, (laughs) Uh, then they are able to remain calm within the chaos as it's continuing its path because everything happens as it should. Uh, it is, it is, um, there's a famous saying by I think Yogan Nanda who said, I don't mind what happens no matter what, what the chaos was going on around. I don't mind what happens. So that that's about when I'm working with people, it, I'm wanting them to go to that place after we've dissolved beliefs and so forth is when you come from this place of non-reactivity and a and, and neutral stance, the ego has no nothing to attach to. It says, well, I don't mind what happens. But, but, no, I don't mind what happens. <laughs> it's so, so there's nothing to feed off of. That no, was the beginning of my journey a few years ago was, you know, I worked with this, you know, angel coach, May Love, and, and that's what she, that's her, like, literally her jam is she focuses on the ego and how to starve the ego, as she says. And so when I did like my first round of work with her, I was like, oh my God, this is so intense. But then after I went through it, I was like, oh my gosh, but there's like no reactions. And like, where's my normal triggers? And where's my, you know, like all this stuff. And I realized like, wow, because it's all what you were just saying. It can't attach. There was nothing to feed it anymore. And it just like, not that it's gone, but it's essentially asleep. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And when it does get triggered, it's the investigation process is, oh, who triggered that? What's the reflection? What is it that I haven't dealt with emotionally? And, you know, so I, I this is my opinion, uh, you know, in, in what the work I do, other pe- people might have different opinions, but it's like, well, let's investigate what that emotion is and where that's coming from. And do we... Do we need to gently just look at that, bring it up, let it go and so forth. And there's also, I don't mind what happens, but to be careful not to create avoidance with that statement as well. Mm -hmm. And when you speak about the investigation, that also goes back to what you were kind of saying earlier, which is not only that work, but also like recognizing and being aware of like what that is and not letting it compartmentalize and seeing it for what it is, being aware, and then essentially letting it move through. Exactly. Yeah. So powerful. And so when you were saying, you know, the collective shadow and then our own inner shadow, it's like, so essentially kind of two shadows going on. We're dealing with our own shit that's coming up and then we're dealing with the collective. Really, we're in this massive shadow right now, right? As far as the collective. Absolutely. And so, uh, as I said before, we could call that uh, we're moving into sovereignty from enslavement or, you know, acquiescence as a shadow. And then individually, we've got far more refined aspects of our story to be looking at. And, and, and still, it's liberation it's, it's versus enslavement or powerlessness uh, versus power or love versus not being loved. But, you know, the individual story is one's own to work with. Yeah. Well, and I know a lot of people have asked me, you know, like, oh, but what do I do about my family or my friends or my relationship? Like they're so asleep and they don't see anything and they don't get it at this point. They think I'm crazy. And I'm like raising my hand, been there, still there. You know, I, you know, like, what do you say to those people who are raising their consciousness, who are doing the work, who are working with their inner being, their higher self, whatever it may be that resonates for someone. 
and the person in their life or the family or whatever it may be just isn't or maybe isn't even aware to and they're in their own, you know, sleep, essentially, I mean, you know, I know it's a loaded question, but how do people, you know, kind of navigate that from the space of what you're saying of healing and also like what's, I don't want to say what's to come for those people, but like, how do we move as a collective to a higher consciousness and come to the unit you speak of unity and sovereignty and, you know, love and compassion if we're still in polarity with those people because they just don't see or refuse to see? That is such a great question <laughs> <laughs> because we're all facing it, aren't we, on some, oh on some level? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So the, the first thing I would say to that is if you are being triggered by people who cannot hear, listen, want to argue with you, it's practicing non-reactivity and seeing what it is that's, what are they, are they rejecting? Is it rejection? Not being heard? What is it about your own reaction to them that needs addressing as opposed to those people needing to be educated? You can only do what you can do. If people are not ready to hear it, you quietly stay in peace either around them or not. You, you exit the room. I always, and when I get asked this question a lot, I say to my clients, find your tribe in order to raise your vibration. Then if you are around people who want to argue with you, your vibration is raised and perhaps that will have an impact without the words because your light is expansive. Your light is all encompassing and the compassion that you've learned for your tribe, yourself, and even others has an effect. It, 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 it's not an analysis. It just does. It has an impact. And so that space that you're holding of peace and tranquility, it diffuses the ego. My own personal experience is that I never get anyone arguing with me. It just, it just never happens. I can he hear what they're saying and I only come across here and there and whatnot, people questioning it. And I can hear the fear. That's one of the first things I can hear. But then I'm just holding space and gently, very gently saying in the moment what it is that's coming through, what, what needs to be said without judgment, without, uh, without um, anger or, or any form of pushback or you're crazy or oppositional force and just hold space. Now, if that person needs to be right, well, again, in the present moment, I'll decide whether I need to remove myself because the energy is not conducive for me to continue expanding or continue being in my in, in my holy space, my sacred space. Yeah, so powerful. Yeah. And it goes back to that neutrality that you spoke about and being able to come to a space of not complacency, not not handling your emotions, but really just coming to a neutral space and saying like, does this serve me? How am I going to be in this space? And not allowing yourself to react to their lower vibration, essentially. Absolutely. But that you, it, it's doing that with such awareness so you don't get pulled in. Because on occasion, in other, other things, I get pulled in and go, what? And not, not with this that we're talking about, but other things that like trigger me, like pedophilia or uh, injustices. as like, what? <laughs> and it's like, no, no, cut come back and just go into that space. I'm much better off assisting in what I feel or how I could assist rather than blowing a gasket. And I'll give you an example of that was that when I was in Uganda on my first uh, humanitarian project, there was a pedophile in the school system that I worked at. And that really gets me. I, I just, I cannot stand by. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I had to step back because I was being told what this teacher was doing to one of the, the girls specifically, but it was also bribing the other girls for sex. And they ranged in age between, uh, I think, eight and 13. And it was accepted that that was just how it was. And I, I just couldn't believe that. You know, I was outraged. But then I had to step back and say, well, my outrage isn't going to fix anything. And as a white person in a, a rural, uh, black, beautiful community, this was going on. 
And I was like, okay, I shouldn't be interfering. This is, you know, they should leave them to, to deal with it. But perhaps if they ask for help, I'll help. So I, I went and I said, do you want help? Does the social worker, do you need help with this? Do, is there anything I can do? Yes, yes. Okay, permission, granted. And then uh, through my means, I was able to actually do something with, which got rid of him out of the school wow. system and also out of like the community because the community knew about it, but oh, there's a process involved. It's very, very different to our process, but there was a process involved. And so I give you that example because it was so close to my heart and I was so outraged and so angry by what was happening and continuing to happen and the influence or the impact on that girl specifically is that I needed to get personally out of the way and needed to tap into my intuition and also ask permission to be able to do what I could do that felt right, that was going to create the impact that was required to remove him. So I, that's, that's now how I work and I hope to work. I don't always get it right. It's like sometimes I fall on my face and uh, I need to like check in and say, oh, that was a big reaction. <laughs> <Pull back. laughs> okay so but yeah. I mean that's a I mean that's a huge process and also like with you I'm the same with pedophilia and trafficking and all of it and I mean you know I can't even imagine I mean the fact that you even like were able to come from that higher space and that intuition to be like okay can I step in can I have permission because like yeah of course like you would trigger over something like that especially if it's in close to your heart and want to jump in immediately and just you know fix and do and I think that's how so many of us feel right now, right? Like knowing what a lot of us know as awakened ones about trafficking, about pedophilia, about all the things that have gone on. And so many that are like, I just want to jump in and fix it. I just want to end this. I just want this to go away and all these things. And then they also want to shake and wake people up at the same time because they're like, I want you to see this. You need to know that this is happening. You need to know that this is this evil. You need to understand how evil this goes. You need to understand the agendas. Like, you know, the list goes on. And it's so easy, myself included, to get caught up in that and to be like, I mean, that was me with like half my friends and family was like, just trying to wake you the fuck up. Like, you know, it was like, let me shake you. And that did nothing. Kind of how you were saying like that blowing of that gasket. That's exactly what it was. It was like, the hell is she talking about? She's gone crazy. She's gone mad. Like conspiracy theorists, I've been called everything, you know, and it was like, you know, can't deal and, you know, just complete shutdown opposite of what I wanted, you know? And so I think that's like a really good point of what you spoke to, because I feel like really so much of the awakened ones in the collective are dealing with that massively right now on so many different levels. That's right. And they can feel incredibly persecuted. Uh, you know, people who are perhaps a little bit uh, more aware around what is actually happening, but to have compassion for those who don't and who are afraid because it really boils down to the fear and and also fear of authority as well, doing the right thing, complying in order to belong on some level. So we can only have compassion. Yeah, so true. It's true, that compliance piece. I realized that too. I'm like, wow, there's so much of that compliance and fear that ties in together so much of like, well, I should just do what I'm told because that's what I'm told. And it's like, like you were saying before, that's exactly what we're breaking away from is getting out of that enslavement that we haven't even been aware that we've been in and getting to sovereignty. Absolutely. And it's a journey like with anything else, but this one is a really acute bottleneck squeezing <laughs> <laughs> in a very short time frame. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this is not like 10, 20 years. This is happening now and going to happen in the next like few years as far as essentially all this playing out in one shot, which is just kind of insane and incredible. <laughs> right so if you i guess if we look at it it may be a five-year duration but then when we look at other wars such as the french revolution and the american revolution we're looking at like seven to ten year time frames in which when from the start to the finish of creating something new or something uh, something different so yeah this is this is similar nothing happens overnight and it's that's why it's such so important to meditate to come back into this non-reactive state and watch as if i'm not saying sit on your armchair and just you know pop the popcorn and observe because you <laughs> do something but nonetheless watch the reaction come from a place of peace even though the chaos is going on and step in when you're needed 
step in when you're needed. Yeah, that's so true. It's like you have to kind of pick where you feel like you really can serve and you can do something versus kind of wanting to be involved in all things. I had to do that too in the beginning of 2020. I was like involved in everything. And I was like, okay, I'm not making any difference. I'm just lighting fires everywhere. And it was like, okay, I have to like pull back. And like you said, you know, for me, got into meditative state and my breath work and all those different things. And then I was able to be like, okay, I came home to myself. Now I can start to kind of like figure out the things I want to focus on and what's important and what I can maybe help some people see or feel the light is being shown on and, you know, all that. So yeah, those are so many good points. And the compassion piece, I think is really important because I'm not going to lie. There's so many times where I have a hard time being compassionate. And I think a lot of people do right now too, you know, especially in a space where you are being, you know, essentially persecuted and called, you know, insane and crazy and conspiracy and being locked out of restaurants and not allowed to do things. And the list goes on. It's a very heavy place, you know? And so having to remember like that compassion, not only for the people that are following rules that shouldn't be that like are just doing it thinking like that's what they're supposed to be doing, but then also for yourself, right? Like being like, okay, but I know my truth. I know what's going on. So like, I have to come back to that. Absolutely. And that's, that's your strength, you know, it's being centered. Also, if you look at it from the perspective of if they're shutting you out of restaurants or libraries or whatnot, they're already preempting you to start a new system by locking you out of the old. And so you're, you know, it, it's an opportunity in order for you to see that I don't, need to participate in that anymore i am my sovereign self i've got friends there are cafes or there are restaurants or there are places i can go i can even have picnics yet it is pushing those of us who are being locked out into these other spheres of creating something new because if we're sick and tired of being rejected or uh, persecuted then the choices are we create something new very true this is what i'm yeah so this is what i'm seeing going forward because at this point again i'm not saying i could be wrong but i'm not seeing us going back to the way things used to be every everything's going to change from the way that the medicine is um is conducted to power to education um you know, to food systems, all of it, all of it is and currency, especially currency, which is the backbone of how we exchange, all of it is changing. So we might as well get on the bandwagon and start as the, uh, I don't know, the change makers, the light bearers, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we might as well and get in it. I had that conversation with my friend Ryan earlier because he's super awake and, and we do a lot of projects together. And, I, and that's what he said to me, he's like, what are we waiting for? Like, let's just start doing our own stuff. It's all going to happen anyway. So like, why would we wait? Why would we wait to jump on the bandwagon? Why would we do it now? Why don't we be the people in front of it? And I'm like, yeah, no, I agree with you completely. You know, and I think more and more people are starting to get into the activating space. I feel like for those of us who are awakened, or at least the ones I've spoken to and a lot of light workers, you know, in this time of 2022, it's like 2021. I feel like a lot of us went through the shadow that you spoke of, went through a lot of our own healing, went through a lot of different things. And now we're coming into like this integration and activation spot. And it's like, okay, now what do I do to essentially take my power back and then help serve the community in the process? Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. we're doing it. You're yeah. <laughs> well, I'm certainly, to, you know, put one foot in front of the other every day and just kind of like, all right, here we go. I don't really know what I'm doing. This journey is wild. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I have no control and no clue, but I'm just doing <laughs> I'd like to mention the other other aspect of what is occurring so rather than planning or rather than the old way of traditionally setting out some sort of structure or mind orientated willful idea we're now being asked to trust imagine create hold faith and it happens as we go it's listening to that inner voice that says go this way on Wednesday <laughs> <laughs> by Saturday just a little tweak over to that way and so what we're seeing is this movement from the mind into the heart where the heart is instructing us but doesn't have the same voice as what the mind does it's a much deeper knowing 
conscious way of navigating life, but it's different. So we're getting used to how do we do that? Because there's nothing to hang on to anymore. Right. <laughs> there's nothing to hang on to. It's literally like you're just free falling. You're like, all right, here we go. Like there's, it's just so funny because I think about myself too. And I'm like, man, I used to control everything. I mean, everything. And I'm like, wow, I really am not controlling anything. I mean, even with my own girls, I feel like it's so funny, like, especially with the Chi Chi portal and all things going on with energy wise, it's like, they've been so uncontrollable for like how they normally are with me. And I've had to release so much and just be like, all right, you want to play? Play. Like, you want to scream? Go ahead. Like, and not control, you know, the situation and just know that like, it's going to figure itself out. And then it does instead of me going against it and being like, okay, come on, like, we need to calm down. We need to just, you know, like, and just kind of releasing and all that. I realize it's actually nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with me. <laughs> yes. So this is, and don't you feel better for it? Yeah, for not sure. Have, yeah. So there's, there's a relief in being able to not take responsibility beyond the need of taking responsibility. Yeah. Oh, that's powerfully said with the responsibility. Yeah. And I think too, right? Like we, um, as a collective, we maybe haven't taken any responsibility, right? Like we've allowed, like you said, the compliance, we just do as we're told. We just go on this hamster wheel. Like you said, the treadmill, we just go, go, go. And then everything that's played out, it's like, oh, actually, no, you have to take responsibility for your life. And like, you actually are in charge. And there's actually a magic to that, but like, you have to actually step into that versus following the system who's just going to tell you what to do and you're going to unconsciously do everything and not actually create absolutely so this creative process that you're talking about is coming from a heart center now we're no longer having a job for the sake of having a job because if you look at the statistics i think 80 percent of people are dissatisfied with the job they're in but they're paying bills are on the treadmill now imagine creating from the level of at the heart consciousness love a new system that allows people to be satisfied fulfilled together in, in such a different way so this is why we're coming back to this place because this place is speaking truth around wow. where we go yeah so that's even like a, that's such a great way to kind of bring this full circle is when you were speaking about that unity, that love, that higher consciousness, that sovereignty, it's truly coming back to our heart center and, and our and our homes to be able to not only speak truth, but like you said, to create and manifest, you know, this new earth, essentially. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. This has been such an amazingly cool conversation. I love how we kind of got to go all over and and honestly you're you're such a light and you have such an amazing energy about you you can feel it even just like over zoom there's something so powerful within you so i'm really excited that everyone gets to receive this and receive your energy um if people do want to be healed by you or work with you um in the healing process you know um in their journey or they want to find you and you know check out what you're doing where can we find that and that'll all be in the show notes well, firstly, I wanted to say thank you for like that beautiful compliment. You too have such an amazing yeah. energy about you. And so on the same page, I find you that you just listen and you're an amazing interviewer. You ask beautiful questions. So thank you. Oh, thank you. So where people can find me is on simonegordon.com. That's uh, S-Y-M-M-O-N-E, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N. I'm not sure whether you put that anywhere but i'll put in the show notes it's all good yeah uh yeah so that's where they can find me and we go from there amazing so they can contact you there and then um they can get on your newsletter which i have guys it's incredible she sends you like these really cool intuitive oracle cards that you can click on digitally and essentially like get little messages and tap into it so it's it's a really cool fun uplifting space um so i highly recommend you go check out her website and her newsletter and all the incredible things she's doing in the healing realm. And again, this will be all in the show notes. And again, Simone, thank you so much for being here. And for all of you who have listened and tapped in and, you know, been here, just know you weren't here by accident. You were meant to receive these messages and these words. And, you know, wherever you are in your awakening journey, just know you're not alone and come home to your heart space, as Simone said, and find your truth, because that's where we are all going and what we need to be all doing together. So thank you so much, Simone. You're so welcome. All right, guys, love and light. I will see you soon. Bye.